Welcome everybody to this Motorsport Magazine podcast in association with Mercedes-Benz. Hey Jack, have them. Um, I've got new ones. You look really grown up. Very smart, Jack. <laughs> that your sisters. <laughs> Can I have that? Jack. I like the way you work it. No diggity. I got to bag it up. Bag it up. I like the way you and what a treat we have for you today. Um, Martin Brundle is our guest, Le Mans winner, F1 driver, um, and one of the best commentators in the world, and that goes for any sport. Does that make you feel good? Yeah? That embarrasses me, thank you very much. Good stuff, we'll start with the embarrassment. Thank you for joining us today, appreciate it very much. Um, Also with us is uh, Simon Aaron, who is Motorsports Features Editor. Um, Simon has been an F1 reporter for a very long time. I won't say how long you followed the circuit for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, sort of slightly, slightly retired from Formula One now, but yes, I, I, I was doing the same thing as Martin, spending my life in departure lounges and hotel lobbies for <laughs> many, many years. Okay, so today we are going to discuss Martin's career, um, or perhaps we should say careers. Uh, we're going to talk about Formula One and sports cars and the great drivers he's competed against. And, um, and Martin, I'm, I'm sorry to do this so, so early, but let's get the halo thing discussed and talked about and then can we just put it away and not talk about it again is that is that all right <laughs> i wish we could put the halo away and never talk about it again <laughs> so go on then give give us your uh, uh d- your views <sighs> we will get used to it i think even in week two of the testing it's, it's a bit like every time I s- i've seen a 2018 car it's like talking to somebody that they've got a big red spot on the end of their <laughs> nose you try not to look at it <laughs> but you can't help it and it's the first thing i see it's aesthetically of course it's awful uh, but it's that's not what upsets me so much about it uh, it's more that it, what it stands for and where for me it's like a uh, like the massive runoff areas we have now and it, it's just becoming too white too anesthetized too um you know it, it doesn't it's not how a Formula 1 car should be. I, yeah. I want to be a little bit frightened when I'm driving a Formula 1 car, and I want to be a little bit frightened when I'm watching Formula 1. That's, that's why we don't want to see death in the name of any sport, of course, and we don't want to see injury. But with the halo, and once, once it was declared such a thing existed, of course, the genie was out of the bottle. It has to yeah. go on the car because of the blame culture and claim culture that we live in today. But uh, it, it just... Where do we go next? That's my concern. Yeah. A, a driver will get injured some other way. And, and for me, if you just carry on like this, you know, ironing the racetracks so they look like billiard tables mm. and creating endless runoffs and hiding the drivers inside the car and behind a halo like this, um, it, you just got to carry on and eventually take the driver out of the car, autonomous racing. Yeah. So I think it's a critical point for Formula One is, what, what are we? What do we do? For example, if the Six Nations um, became touch rugby, you'd laugh, wouldn't you? Yes. You'd laugh your head off. Yeah. If we put stabilizers on Valentino Rossi's motorbike, you would laugh. Mm. Uh, sadly, I'm not laughing at the halo. Um, but, it, you know, back in the 70s and 60s, of course, if a driver had a crash, there was a very good chance he was going to break his legs, get burned, or die. Um, and something needs to be done. So they were fundamentals like seat belts, like crash helmets and you know, uh, putting bag tanks in so the car didn't automatically catch fire. Before that, of course, their, be- their best chance of surviving was to get thrown out of the car. That's what they hoped to do. And we've seen the incredible pictures, haven't we, from, from that era. Um, but, but this is, you know, we just keep relentlessly now taking the peril out of it and I don't want the safest place to be at a Grand Prix is inside the racing car. And I only say that slightly jokingly. Um, you know, For me, safety begins first and foremost with the fans. They're paying to be entertained, not yeah. injured. Yeah. Next up are the corner workers and marshals and, and, and those, those that are around the track trying to you know, protect the drivers, as it were. They've not bought into to being injured. They're there to, um, and often unpaid to 
because they, they have a passion for motorsport and they, they want to be involved. Next up for me are the people, uh, the, the pit stop crew. Um, a, again, I think they bought into a certain amount of damage. If you're going to stand there and have some crazy young kid drive at you at uh, 50, 60 miles an hour in a Formula One car um, while you're going to do a two second pit stop. And those people sitting on the pit wall. Yeah. And for me then, the drivers are the last, you know, when you step over the side of a racing car or step into a racing car, you're taking a risk, you bought into a risk. And I think um, that, I think I've said enough on the halo. Sorry, that's like five minutes, wasn't it? But uh, as you can tell, I'm quite animated about it. Do you think there will come a time, I mean, you and I grew up, we're only a couple of years different, similar time, watching motor racing through the 60s, the 70s, when the, there was still a, a gladiatorial aspect to it almost. Um, long after our generations are buried and gone and the, yeah, there are no physical memories left of those eras, do you think that the, there will come a time when people just accept that motor racing is a... because they won't know any different, they won't know that there were ever, you know, there was no runoff area, that there were no bag tanks, that there was no halo. I mean, do you think, do you think the sport will survive um, and people just accept that it's a, a safe sport, or, or do, you, do you think there's a risk that this continual kind of diminishing of the risk could it could actually sort of lead to its demise? I think it's a, a, ma a major issue. Yes, I do. Um, you know, if you look at something like ultimate cage fighting, that's got mm. an incredible following around the world, um, or boxing or whatever. Mm. You know, if you took the you know, if if you you know weren't in boxing, if the you know the heavyweight championship of the world was uh, contested by boxers with head with protection, halos. with well their, <laughs> their equivalent yeah. of halos, yeah. Yeah. Uh, like you sometimes see, I think at the Olympics, don't you? But the, again, um, yeah, the amateurs still have head protection. Yeah. Yes. Mm. So that that's it, isn't it? What are you going to do? You're going to stop boxing. You're going to stop a Moto GP. You you know and. Of course, we have car manufacturers involved and they sell their product on safety, based on safety, uh, a lot of it, isn't it? It's one of their primary selling points. So I, I see their point, but I've been to some racing drivers' funerals and I've seen death. I've, I've seen death on a racetrack. My son's a professional racing driver, so I don't take it lightly. I, they're not throwaway comments on my part, but I, I do think this is a, a pivotal point for motorsport and Formula One. And um, where, where does it... Where does it go from here? Uh, and then, you know, other people would quite, quite rightly say, well, hang on a minute, you know, what about the crash protection uh, on the side of the car? What about mm -hmm. all of the other, you know, the rear crash structure or um, the other things that we do? Um, why don't you take those off the car? And, you know, that's a valid point and, and quite hard to argue against. But yeah. uh, this thing just, for me, I'm sorry, is just a step too far. Yeah, there is a cascade issue, isn't there, that it will lead to other things, but it's going to take a brave person to say this car is safe enough, you know? Uh, yes, it is. And of course, uh, you know, if there's if a driver's killed, I'm not the one uh, having to go to court and, and defend myself because it's not my decision. But I, I would be happy to be in that position, if, I, if I'm honest, because I think... Um, I think we've got, but yes, you know, where where do you draw the line in the sand? What is what is safe enough? What's too safe? What does motor racing stand for? What is the, you know, the the mm. USP of Formula One? And um, for me, that halo and the way the tracks are evolving is too far. Yep. Okay. Right. I think we've ticked off the halo. <laughs> um, Yes, it must be so nearly over. <laughs> I, think, I think we did well. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Martin. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, we're gonna, we are now going to do what we always do in, in the motorsport podcast. We are going to jump um, thirty years or so to um, your 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 early days as a motor racing driver, as a racing driver. But I'm going to ask him because Simon's always got a really interesting way of communicating, describing how somebody works their way to the top, and yours was an unconventional rise to the top so I'm going to ask you to describe <laughs> it and I'm going to see if I'm Martin sure I ever made it to the top <laughs> well, I, I, sadly I, I, uh, I never got to see Martin racing uh, bangers was it Potro or Potro in Potro Pot three Rowing miles in, from where I live now yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and the banger now, racing no, no, upmarket no, banger racing upmarket banger right now, yeah, there, yeah. Now, now sadly defunct but I did see what I believe was his first circuit race and it's um, when you're a kid you go along you look at the race programme, see what's entered, and there was a special saloon race, everyone, which meant generally escorts in some minis, and there was a bloke entered in a Toyota Celica, 
and I'd never heard of Martin Brundle. And um, I was a bit disappointed when I saw the car, to be honest, because it didn't look that modified. It didn't have massive flared arches and a and a spoiler on the back. But it was clearly a relatively... St- I quickly worked out it was a British saloon car, championship spec car. And um, you were 17, and you were collecting signatures before you, you started in the BSCC. But he came to Alton Park and did a special saloon race in March 1977. And um, he was running up against all these highly modified cars, he's running eighth and ninth or something, I mean, overall, against... Mm. And he thought, well, that thing shouldn't be, <laughs> shouldn't be anywhere near there. But, um, and I looked at the note, and it said he was 17 or whatever, I read in Autosport or Motor and News, and I thought, that's quite impressive. And I was also jealous, because yeah. he was only about a year older than I was. And I thought, well, what's he... Well, <laughs> the, the, ch- the chances of me you being... You weathered well, you weathered well, yeah, Sam. The, 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 the chances of me being in a racing car 12 months from now are you know, yeah. somewhere south of zero. But, yeah. I mean... Martin went from that and then he appeared in the British Saloon Car Championship back at Alton a few weeks later and was running right at the front in his class with Richard Lloyd, very experienced driver in his VW Golf. And then he did saloon cars with Audi, then he went Ford 2000, went quite well. Then he did Formula 3 and then he met out in Senna and beat him a few times and 10 minutes later Ken Tyrrell had signed him. So it it wasn't going from a field in Norfolk in a banger to a Tyrrell F1 car took what, seven or eight years? Well, actually, I've, I've, I'm going to jump in with oh. some research here that you know, oh, I'm not going to waste. <laughs> yeah. um, you, your first British Grand Prix to watch, Brands Hatch 66, 10 years later, you were looking to buy a touring car team. Nine years later, you were on the grid for your first ever British Grand Prix. As you watching that Grand Prix in 66... Yeah. Never, never would have happened, right? You didn't have this burning ambition to be a racing driver, should I say? No, it might even have been 64, the first one right. I went to, was at Brandt Hatch. But I remember my mum waking me up in the, uh, like four o'clock in the morning, and like, Uncle Keith's taking you to the Grand Prix today. I'm like, great. And, uh, and so I remember mooching around the paddock, picking up all the Yardley BRM stickers and whatever <laughs> there was at the time. I can't remember the years exactly. And we stood on Paddock Hill Ben. I stood in a polite queue uh, to get Jack Brabham's autograph. He sat in wow. his Ford Zodiac or Zephyr in, uh, in the paddock afterwards, and we, he just walked through the paddock. Acker Bilk was playing, I think. We were on the pit <laughs> strip. We were actually on, we were on the racetrack at one point, and I was just mesmerised by it. Then uh, they only used to go to Silverstone to watch, um, standing, and we used to take some wood and some cardboard mm. and that to start to everybody sort of raised themselves up a little yeah. bit uh, on the bank at cops and did i ever imagine i would be a uh, formula one driver no way it was uh, just inconceivable um so yeah it, it was it was reasonably fast track i got lucky along the way that i went hot rod racing there was a, it, my banger days ended i won the overall final of the day in my 105e ford anglia and somebody took umbrage at this so there was an under 1500 class and an over 1500 class so I'm going around you put the checkered flag in the window and I'm going around and uh, celebrating winning the grand final of the day and I probably got 20 quid for that or something <laughs> and this guy reversed round in a I think it was a Zephyr or something and wrote me off he hit, <laughs> reversed into me and wrote me off and then came after me with a crowbar in the pits. And my dad came to pick me up because he used to drop me off in the morning. I'd go racing and he'd pick, when he'd finished selling cars, whatever time of the Sunday that was, pick me up at the end of the day in, in our transit. And uh, we decided that was, we've got to get out of there. So we went Speedworth hot rod racing, except the problem is I was 15. I, I needed to be 16. So we told Fibs about that. <laughs> then I was racing the great Barry Lee and people like that, George Pollard. Uh, not Pollard. Polly. Polly. Um, Duffy Collard and people like that at uh, the at, uh, um, Hot Rods, which was fantastic. Mm. Then I saw in Autosport one morning, we were Toyota dealers, and I saw in Autosport one morning the Toyota team for sale. And it was the truck, the transporter, and mm. both uh, Wynn Percy's and Wizzo Williams' car was for sale. So we went to Brands Hatch. I met Wynn Percy, who who is one very much was and remains one of my heroes. And the, we, we ended up buying these cars. So we financed the two Celicas as demonstrators and we HP'd the <laughs> truck uh, as a breakdown truck for the garages. We had nil money. So when I ended up, when I went to Alton Park for that first race in the, in the Celica, it was, it was Wynn's car. 
And uh, I remember going to find a phone box in Alton Park, no mobile phones back in 1977, of course. And I stood behind a guy who used to race a Scirocco, Brian, Brian, somebody had a Scirocco. Brown pepper? Yeah, it sounds about right. And, uh, I, and I'm waiting in line to phone to go, I'm on pole. You'd never guess what I'm on pole. It? <laughs> and this guy, just right in front of me, like, was on the phone. He goes, you'll never guess what? It's a 17-year-old on pole. And I was quite proud of myself. Uh, and in that race, I got a puncture. And I'll never forget Bernard Unet in an Avenger following me, chasing me. And he, he, had t he just had this grisly grin. I could see it in my mirror. And he frightened me off the track in the end. Uh, I got a puncture going down Cascades and... Um, I could go on forever, really, um, all, all the stories. But yeah, so a uh, bit of, bit of single-seater, that fell apart. Back to touring cars. I was teammates with Sterling Moss. Ne people never believed me when I said I was teammates with Sterling Moss in 1981. And then BP took me into single-seater racing, and then Ayrton turned up, and boom, we're both in Formula One. Yeah. I, think that, I think it's an interesting um, point that we, when we look at Formula One today and we look at the schooling of the drivers and the fact... Max was in F1 at 17, 18, 19. It's not unusual for these guys to be in Formula 1 when they're teenagers now. Um, but they've been car racing mm -hmm. since they, they were kids. Do, you, do either of you think that they'll, a driver will reach Formula 1 with, a, with an unconventional background like yours? Do you think it's possible anymore for someone to go left, right, left, right and then find themselves at the top? I, well, don't, I'm not sure it's... It's wrong to say that it's not possible to do it without money anymore because there are guys in there at the moment like... Van Dorn, Bottas, who, who haven't come from you know, Raikkonen, who've not come from massive family money, Ocon's another one, who've basically been picked up when they were young because they, you know, their dad sacrificed stuff and um, they got they got spotted and then got help. But you need you need that help at an early stage now, don't you? Because if you don't, yeah, you know, you're not going to get a you're not going to get a sort of a sugar daddy. It was very unlikely to find a sugar daddy who's going to sponsor you all the way through, you know, F three, F two, whatever. Yeah. Um, you need to kind of. You need to be picked up by Red Bull, Mercedes, or yeah. But it, it's it's not just the dad that sacrifices; the whole family do actually. No, absolutely. My mum yeah, sacrificed yeah. loads and holidays and all sorts of things for my racing, and and the siblings have to put up with sitting in a car uh, in a paddock, or sure. and it's it's quite a tough one actually because if you've got one, you know, one sibling that goes racing and another that doesn't, you know, how do you balance that? Up? How do you keep that fair? To answer your question, I don't think it's possible anymore to um, to come through without doing karting yeah. and the junior formula and, and of course now there are point systems in place and you've got you've got to go through some of them yeah. you can't just leap into a formula one car yeah. anymore to get to get your super license so i think you know if you're not karting by seven eight years old it'd be very hard to play catch up yeah i mean yeah. I, I don't think did the banger racing at pot row not, did that not count for points for your super license uh, well, clearly it did, because I, I got one in the end. <laughs> but I tell you, what, tell you what it did do, is when I had um, drivers trying to push me off the track, uh, let's not name names. Um, well, let's, no, no, let's not. Um, I, yeah, it, was, it, it was nothing for me, you know. Yeah. Every, every time uh, Shumi or anybody, when I was his teammate, would try and push me off the road, it was like, that's nothing, mate, compared to having a Ford Zephyr 6 coming at you. Backwards. Backwards. Yeah. In, your, in your Ford Hankler. You can't frighten me. But, uh, I mean, <laughs> although karting is, you know, is, is long, I mean, the karting culture didn't exist when you were coming through the ranks, it's not on the same scale. Um, what you did in hot rod racing, I mean, in terms of car control, traffic management, everything else, that must have been just as good. Uh, 40 odd cars yeah. in a tightly. Yeah. No contact. Like no, no, yeah, contact no contact sport. Yeah. Um, it was. I like uh, hot rod racing. Is good. Yeah, really good. And you had to work your way through the pack and just ed edge, you know, edge through the traffic and without bumping into anything. And you know, but in, but anyway. in plotting a move, you know, it could take two or three laps to get a move yeah. nailed because of the yeah, the, went around the, the outside. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Maybe we yeah. need a hot rod revival. Like there's a Goodwood revival. Yeah. somewhere. It still okay. exists. Well, Wimbledon, exists. Wimbledon closed down, didn't it? It did, but yeah, still, there, there, are, there, are, there are still yep. um, yeah. there are there are still uh, outposts, just not in London. Um, I'm going to jump now to um, a subject that I know that's close to your heart, the, the Grand Prix Trust. Um, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about the Grand Prix Trust and your and your role with them, and maybe how our readers and listeners can get involved. Yeah, and, and I think uh, there might well be a lot of motorsport uh, listeners and, and readers, ma magazine readers, uh, who um, who will be interested in this and who can help us actually, because they m may well know some people who who need who need some help. So I took over from Jackie Stewart, so Jackie Stewart as 
the chairman of the trustees a year or so back. Um, Jackie started this in the 1980s. It was called the Grand Prix Mechanics Trust mm. back then. We dropped the name mechanic because in Formula One parlance these days, you know, mechanic doesn't, it's, there, there is no category of mechanic today, but of course yeah. there, there used to be. So um, we, we like to help people out where we can who fall on hard times, uh, particularly with their health or, or other issues, financial issues. And over 150 teams have gone broke in Formula One. Because a lot of people say, wow, Formula One's so rich. You know, why do you yeah. need to, to help people out in Formula One? Well, of course, the, the, the current teams are, there's 10 of them. Yep. Um, and they've got HR departments. But I'm surprised today, even uh, how many uh, people we help, where they get into some problems that are beyond the remit and resource of a Formula One team, you know, right. human resource department. Yeah. But fundamentally, we're there for the stalwarts and the pioneers of, of yesteryear. It's a 67 year history of Formula One. As I said, 150 teams plus have gone out of business. There were no pensions, healthcare plans, mm. and all of that back, back in those days. And Jackie was absolutely right to, to start this up. And we've helped a lot of people over the course of time. Um, so it's applicable now to anybody who's been involved in Formula One for two years or more okay. in any role, actually, okay. anywhere in the world. And we help, we've helped people in Australia and all that sort of thing uh, um, who, who may be, or and New Zealand, who were Formula One mechanics, you know, yeah. back in the day, yeah. um, in the 60s and 70s or whatever, who end up with some some difficulties so uh, i would say if you um grand prix trust it's online mm. um, i also am trying to make it more of a um, social media hub as well for okay. people who want to stay in touch with facebook or or, or whatever um and sort of meet re-meet some of their their old colleagues right. or, or c communicate with them so um we, we we quietly do a lot of good obviously i i can't explain some of the things where we've helped individuals yeah. because yeah. of confidentiality and, and I wouldn't want to do that. So um, we've got um, two ladies who work um, for us, uh, uh, Ali in the administration, Sally, who is our client coordinator. She's highly trained in, uh, and do you know, sometimes we help a lot of people out without spending one pound because uh, Sally knows where all the green buttons are. There's so many facilities out there yeah. uh, in social care <laughs> that, um, you don't know what you don't know. So yeah. if somebody knows, like, okay, you've got that problem. Well, here's, here's you know, contact these people, here's yeah. this, this facility. Um, and we do a lot of good. And, and so anybody that can help us, I would appreciate. And if uh, anybody reading Motorsport uh, Mag and, and listening to this knows of people who have been involved in Formula One who uh, have ended up with problems, then contact the Grand Prix Trust. Okay, thanks, Martin. I mean, what, what, what sort of fundraising <coughs> activities do you do? We get donations. Uh, we've got an industry leader challenge this year. I've got uh, Christian Horner's going to try and drive with Terry Grant on two wheels. Um, we're just finding an Aston Martin for him to do that in now. Um, <laughs> we are, uh, so Christian, I think he's regretting saying he would do that. Um, and um, we had a very generous donation recently. Um, but the, Jackie always talked about the big one you know, a car mm. over the pit wall into the pit lane, you yeah. know, and, and hurting a lot of people. I think safety regulations and um, in, you know, multi-level uh, of insurances has sort of negated that concern as the decades have yeah. passed since he started this in the 80s. For me now, the big one, I look at Formula One and I see between 700 and 1,000 people making two racing cars uh, for 21 races effectively. And I look at that and think, that's unsustainable. Mm. I don't think that's going to last. Yeah. Uh, sad to say, I'd like to see a lot more teams come in so we can fill the grid up with 26 cars and, and absorb. But for me, there's going to be a change. It has to. It's so, you know, when Ross left Mercedes, there was a cap of 650 people. Now there are 1,000 people. Is it going to go to 1,500 people? What, mm. What's going to happen? So there's, there's going to be a change. And I think the Grand Prix Trust will be there when it when it when it's needed okay if you would like some more information on the, the grand prix trust then please head to our website i mean obviously you can google the, the grand prix trust and um, we'll be posting an article on motorsportmagazine.com about the trust and, and the great work that it does and to reiterate anyone who's been involved in formula one for for two, two years, years from a trucky marketing yeah. good old-fashioned mechanic yep yeah absolutely okay great stuff right okay so um I think around 10 years after the early saloon car um, 
adventures. You're in Rio, tremendously, must have felt tremendously exotic, exciting, and you're about to test your first Formula One car. Um, and I'm sure I read in your book that 12 laps after you started your test, your, your head was falling off your, your yeah. shoulders. And, and I, <laughs> it was, I came in the pits and stopped. <laughs> well, really embarrassingly, I came in the pits, and of course I'd, I'd only ever done F3 and that sort of thing. I came in the pits for the first time at the end of my 12 lap run to this sea of color. I didn't know, I couldn't remember where my pits were. <laughs> I, was in a, I was in a terror, like I stopped. I stopped at every pit along the way. Till, and they're all laughing at me and waving me, waving me through. I mean, you didn't have all the fancy rig like they have today. The and lights. you could imagine yeah. the hardened, you know, wizened <laughs> Formula One mechanics were like, get up. Yeah. And eventually I stopped and recognized some, some people from yeah. the Tyrrell team. And I sat there and then the heat, heat of, of Rio so, and the yeah. F1 car and you know the, the I'd driven the Tyrrell at Silverstone on a crispy morning right. and gone very well and I'd driven the McLaren with an amazing day with Senna and Beloff and myself we're all given a, a test drive in the McLaren uh, again on a cold crispy day at at Silverstone <laughs> suddenly <laughs> I'm in the heat and humidity of Rio and the, all the heat coming off the radio yeah. it was that little Tyrrell 012, the one that stopped. The side pods were back yeah, here. Yeah, the they? one yeah. that stopped around my <laughs> elbow, didn't it? As you're sort of sitting on top of it. And uh, yeah, and the, the rads were just sitting there and it, it welled up and I had to get out because I was going to throw up, basically, which was a great start. Was there my any Formula preparation? Yeah, I mean, did anyone ever say to you, this is going to be tough? This is, you're going to struggle, you need to do this, you need to hang some weights off your neck. Was there any yeah. preparation in that respect? No. I didn't know Just anything about that. I should have done, but I didn't know anything about yeah. it at all. Nor did Senna. I was going to say, that yeah. Ed, Ed's neck yeah. didn't hold out either. Did, you, did, you, did his neck last 12 laps, or did you beat him on that one? I don't, I don't know. He, uh, well, my career started a lot better than Ed's, and he was really annoyed about it. He was really annoyed about it, because I was fifth in the first number. But I yeah, hadn't got the drive yeah. at this point. Right. So oh, okay. Ken took me to the test. And if you remember, back in those days, the only sponsor on the side of the car was Tyrrell. Tyrrell. <laughs> yes. um, and yeah, it was and now we think, wasn't that pretty? <laughs> yeah, it was a beautiful looking car, but yeah. in that respect. And I remember going, I had one set of qualies. I'm going down the back straight and Derek Warwick's catching me in the works Renault down the back. And remember, the normally aspirated versus turbo is like a 30 mile an hour <laughs> speed difference down the back straight. And... Derek edges up alongside me. I don't know whether he was on qualies or not. And I'm like, I can't lift. This is my one one quali lap. So I just almost close my eyes and turn in. Because Rio was just a huge number of high speed left hand turns. Do you ever remember? Do you remember PK winning there? With his yeah, head yes, yeah, fell yeah, out of yeah, the yeah, car, yeah. didn't he? Flailing yeah. out the side of the car. It was, it was so tough. Yeah. And, um, and I can't lift. I can't lift. And I cut Derek off <laughs> and of course from the pits you could see the back straight and the turn I remember on Ray, uh, race day the because there was no cover to the grandstand the fire because they used to come in really early the fans yeah. and sit yeah. there with no cover in the sun and the, they used to take a fire hose down there and hose the crowd off basically to cool them down um, because they were sitting there for hours waiting for us to race and Ken Tyrrell saw this and he loved it Ken loved that kind of thing that I cut up the works <laughs> Renault driver to get my lap in but I still hadn't got the drive and then I got called down to Ockham uh, in February or something like that and went into Ken's office that was a nice six hour return drive that was um, for me from Norfolk mm. no problems and uh, here we go and he, and he, he said to me um, well uh, uh, unfortunately, and I'd offered him 150 grand sponsorship, which I didn't have one pound of. <laughs> I didn't have a quid, but I thought I'll, I'll worry about that later. And he said, okay, the bad news is I, I, st I haven't found a sponsor. Oh, my heart sank. Um, he said, but the good news is I'm going to sign you anyway. And I'm like, I want to climb all over the ceiling. <laughs> And I just sat there. I remember it so clearly sitting in Ken's office. And you could see Bo, who used to do the fiberglass stuff and make your seats, you know, looking out, going, he was uh, doing that <laughs> behind Ken's shoulder. And um, 
and he said and I know you haven't got 150 grand so f let's forget that and off we went racing paid me he gave me a car I, I, I owned 30,000 pounds the first year including all of my own I had to pay all my own expenses so I made more money so, on the uh, the cheap Mercedes deal we were allowed to do back then <laughs> than I did driving the car I made <laughs> two or three grand out of that or something um, and, I, and I got the drive incredibly do you so, think that chopping the Renault had do you think Ken it didn't it didn't do any harm yeah Ken loved all that sort of thing yeah a bit of a bit of a racer yeah um I, a related note to the, the physicality of, of driving a formula one the formula one car then and now um is is there a is there a kind of a weird pleasure in the physicality of racing a car are you all masochists is i guess what i'm what i'm trying to say <laughs> yeah you want to i mean obviously it's changed significantly and and, and I, i'm not saying it's uh, not as good now because yeah. it's, it, but it's different i mean yeah. I've, I've driven three of these um hybrid formula one cars yeah. and they yeah. are my god they're brilliant you spend yeah. your whole life debriefing in an engineering meeting as a racing driver looking for tiniest you know yeah. and then you jump in something like the latest mercedes had more grip in the pouring rain than i remember anything i drove as a, a, a in the dry as it when the, <laughs> just amazing. and the power the relentless linear power the gearbox yeah. you know you get a beep in your ear to change gear you don't th it, two laps in and it's you don't even think about it. you know you, you get out and they when you're debriefing they ask you about the gearbox you're like I don't know, I didn't notice the gearbox. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure I must have used it. It is so unbelievably good. The brakes are... Uh, so they're masterpieces now. And so the drivers now start homing in to be super accurate, you know, braking right. within a metre or two and the line, the speed they carry and, and all of that thing. So the skill demands have changed. Whereas mm. back in those early days, the cars were monsters, basically. Yeah. And you're... And you're yeah. And I don't say it jokingly, your primary role was to stop them from crashing <laughs> through the afternoon, <laughs> then to go a little bit faster if you could, and then try to keep the car together. So you had to nurse yeah. the car, the dog rings, the drive shafts, the clutch, the brakes, the everything yeah. about it. Um, and that, yes, there were, you know, shifting 2,700 times in Monaco, you get out and you've got blood pouring out of the palm of your hand. You've literally yeah. worn all the skin off the palm of your hand. And there, there was a certain amount of... I took on that car and that racetrack and I beat it. I somehow yeah. got to the end of it. There, there was that sort of that endurance element of it. But, you know, they were just flying bedsteads. They were yeah. death traps, basically. Was there any, is there any correlation whatsoever, apart from the fact they've got a wheel at each corner and a number on the side, between something like the first two Renault Turbo you drove <coughs> and you know, the, the yeah. modern generation of Grand Prix car? Um, in terms of how they handle and perform, no, of course, no, you know, the, the Tyrrell, when we, when I was qualifying in Monaco or uh, Adelaide with 12, 1300 horsepower, it would spin its wheels in top gear halfway down the back straight in, in Adelaide. It's like a little bump and next thing you've lit the rear, you've lit the rear tires up and you're on a qualifying lap and you're in top gear. Um, but you know what, Simon, so I, I know you love going to Alton and Cadwell and it doesn't matter what you drive the challenge is the same you've got a certain amount of power and a certain amount of grip go as fast as you can within the limitations of of what you got and look after it and uh, it doesn't matter whether it's lewis hamilton's latest and greatest 2018 formula one car or like uh, the beautiful aston martin or ferrari that i drove at, at goodwood revival <clears throat> okay well we are going to slow the pace this, this is the retail opportunity that, that I, I drop in at this point. Um, and we're going to slow the pace, but maybe we're not going to slow the excitement. There is a G-Class Ultimate 4x4 driving experience available at the moment via our own partners at Mercedes-Benz. Um, you can enjoy the new G-Class Ultimate 4x4 driving experience. Um, and the expiry date is a year from the purchase. So please take a look uh, at the website or phone 0370. 400 4000 and quote g class ultimate four by four um are you a four by four do you like going uh, out in yeah, the green I, lanes I and have enjoying a four them? by four in the family is that the new g class that is the new g class that's yeah. a great looking i'd like to have a go in that oh, there we go yeah so take a look that's from our, our partners of mercedes-benz um right bouncing back to um turbocharged formula one cars <laughs> um and actually you mentioned earlier on uh, your teammate stefan beloff um we've had a few questions about stefan i think his story is well known um 
I was trying to think last night what question to ask you about Stefan that maybe hasn't been asked before. And all I could think of was if, if, if you were his manager with the knowledge that you have today, how would you plot his career for him? Now, I know this is not necessarily an easy question to Belloff. answer. Yeah, Stefan Beloff, yeah. Um, but it, to many people, it was like he didn't necessarily have guidance. If you could go back, manage him, what would you, where would you have steered him? How would you have got him to the top? Um, I'm not sure I'm qualified to, to say on something like that. Um, but he, he was driving a Porsche because, A, he was brilliant in them. Mm. And, B, and, and I stood and watched him die, unfortunately, because I was driving a Jaguar uh, in the same race. And I'm just about to get in in the pit lane as, as he came down the hill uh, into Eau Rouge. Um, and I was driving the Jaguar because, A, I was pretty handy in it. And, B, just like Beloff, I needed the money. Right. Because right. he would, uh, I don't know if he was on the same deal as me, but he wouldn't, I doubt he'd been getting paid more than me. And that was mm. the, you know, I think we got 60 grand in the second year, 30 grand in the first year. Um, and Tyrrell was always a bit you know, shaky in terms of its finances. You had to, you had to go and drive those other cars. And mm. um, so, and you had a foot in both camps, which mm. served me very well later yeah. on when I flicked back into sports cars and reinvigorated my rec my reputation, my career, if you like. Um, uh, Tim Clues, the, the very well-known man who used to insure everybody, once <laughs> said to me, uh, a great, great guy and very supportive of, of us all, and he sponsored me in Formula 3, Tim did, when, and, and when the Eddie Jordan truck went over the, over the cliff and m uh, my number one mechanic, uh, Rob Bowden, was killed and our cars ended after I'd won the Formula 3 race in Austria, Tim funded... Uh, funded us getting back on track to go and take the fight to centre again at the, ne at the next round. And also, so I, I, I'm, I want to paint him as a racer and, a, 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 and not in any negative way. But he said to yeah. me, uh, Belloff was never going to make old bones. And I think he was right. Yeah. He had a, a bravery uh, and a fearlessness that was just outstanding, uh, extraordinary. And I think also he was desperately trying to make a point that day um, that you know, going round the, the outside, outside of the works Porsche in front of the hole because the pit lane was on that side back then. Um, so if you could give him some advice, and uh, I, I remember going to his funeral and it broke me to bits because to see his, this distress of his girlfriend and his mm. family and all that sort of thing, I was like, because well, you, you're so selfish when you're a racing driver, you, you never stop to think about any of that. Um, but... It, it, yeah, he probably needed a bit of control to go with his um, mm. to go with his speed and fearlessness. But I remember we were in um, we were racing Zandvoort one day, and I was we were always like I had a, like a piece of string, one in front of the other, whatever. We were always nose to tail, yeah. and our tyrols up against the turbos. And on race day, we had a you know we were much closer, especially when we had the very super lightweight one. But um, you know. Stefan would make a move into Tarzan. I'm like, how did he get away with that? And then he'd make another move. I'm like, come on, Martin, come on, Martin. Yes. And I'd, I'd, I'd make a big move. The next thing is, Beloff would be two cars behind me because he would then make another move and it, it was a <laughs> One move even wilder. <laughs> didn't pay off. And, and that, yeah. if I think of him, so if, if you were to put control with his speed and bravery then I, I have no doubt he would have been a certainly a multiple race winner in Formula One yeah. and, and possibly a champion okay um, we're going to jump into some reader questions um, now our, our readers um, I mentioned this in most of our podcasts but they're quite brave so um, usually braver than we are Throw so me in yeah, I'm sitting here, aren't they? exactly yeah um, but they're very knowledgeable audience and thanks everyone for, for sending your questions in uh, first one is from Oscar Matsurath um, about your debut F1 season you lost some incredible results because of Tim Tyrrell's misdemeanours um, you came close to winning at Detroit do you think the punishment fitted the crime uh, no it didn't because we were thrown out for having an auxiliary fuel tank they found trace uh, Ken wouldn't sign because we didn't have a turbo Ken wouldn't sign a document and it needed unanimity from all the team bosses um, and so they found a trace of fuel in a water tank <laughs> and threw us out for an auxiliary fuel tank well we never used to fill it because we had the DFV and then DFY we never used to fill the main fuel tank up we didn't need <laughs> we didn't have enough power to fill the, fill the tank up let alone an auxiliary one so he, we actually and of course, with Ken thrown out of the championship, and I found out about that 
when I was in a room in Harley Street with my legs strapped up and all plastered up and a guy called Barry Gill uh, a great journalist called yeah. Barry Gill rang me somehow got through to my room in a Harley <laughs> Street clinic and uh, said hello mate <laughs> what, what, what have you got to say about about being <laughs> Tyrrell being disqualified from the championship like what you're kidding me Ken hadn't got around to telling me oh, at that no. point probably didn't want to as I was uh, already smashed to bits um, from my accident in um, Dallas um, so no uh, the punishment didn't, didn't fit the crime we were running Ken worked out that you could weigh a car before a race and you could weigh a car after a race you couldn't weigh it during the race so we, but we were fighting cars with yeah. two three hundred horsepower more than us um, so yeah it was it was cheeky that was um, that was in 80 that was 84 wasn't it yeah mm -hmm. not in 85 we still had a great little car in 85 but you know that was very cheeky but it was um, and of course with Ken out of the championship he no longer had a vote and whatever they wanted to do with turbo engines got voted through so that was what that was all about it was a political thing it wasn't a technical thing right. okay um I'm going to jump oh, over Thanks for now. reminding me. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and, I've, and I've still got the trophy at home. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's not going anywhere. Um, okay, this, this is going to take you to the other side of the, uh, the pond. Ed Carlton asks, uh, can you talk about your time in the States doing the IROC series? How did it come about? What was the reception like from the other drivers, especially Dale Earnhardt Sr.? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was Tony Dow who was running the IMSA JAG team. Um, recommended I do it and uh, I turned up I won the first race in Cleveland um, I'd, I'd worked out there was this big water tank sitting in this thing and I said to my mechanic you know, what what exactly is that you know, it wasn't exactly Formula One it was a, in the footwell it was this great big water tank he said that's the brake cooling and you, I could just feel a little micro switch under the brake pedal and you could see the water go down and all that sort of thing oh that's interesting so in the race, I started eighth, I was third at the first corner, and I just took off and left them. It was a fantastic field of drivers, Emmo and um, uh, uh, who, uh, all the NASCAR guys. Yeah. Um, was there, there Danny well, Sullivan, yeah. Al Jr. Yeah. and all sorts of things. And so down, down all the straights, I just felt this little click underneath my foot and I cooled my brakes. And as they began to run out of brakes, I just, and I got them to top the thing right up. And I just took off and won the race by miles. Um, the guy who got upset about that, funny enough, was Terry Labonte. So we're in the, we're in the uh, cool down area. Park Fermi would be too posh a word for it. Cleveland Airfield. <laughs> and Emo, Emo came up to me. I mean, Martin, you drove a beautiful race today. Because that's how. Uh, Emo was just <laughs> the loveliest man. Charming man, yeah. Terry Labonte gets out of his car. He goes, who won? Did he win? <laughs> and somebody said that I had won the race. And then I can't use the words because they're bad words. But then he started banging on the roof of his IROC car. I don't believe... With a few more expletives <laughs> in there. And I, well, that's not very friendly, is it? Um, but now I'm leading the championship. And we, then we did um, Michigan and eventually Talladega but they had me in the fence uh, there was no I was leading the championship <laughs> and there was no way it was $125,000 there was no way this little spotty kid from <laughs> Europe was going home with $125,000 I think I finished second or third in the championship but the Dale Earnhardt reference is obviously a story I told at Autosport Awards one night when so our second child Alex uh, was due and it was the, it became a big story because the race got rained off and now you know would I, was i going to go home to the birth of my son uh, i was just being a selfish racing driver so i didn't um and luckily alex waited or liz waited with alex <laughs> until i so the race was delayed a day and there and there was quite a lot of media around that so i'm sitting on the grid i'm on pole i'm leading the championship it's mitch uh talladega i believe it was the final round and Dale Earnhardt walks by because you have those net you don't have windows you have those nets in the side uh, they're basically NASCARs they were NASCARs yeah. but they're, they're all the same and Earnhardt walks past with his dark glasses on with like a thousand yard stare behind them and as he goes past my netted window he said don't forget your kids <laughs> and carried on walking <laughs> and somehow uh, going into term one he came underneath me and passed me um, anyway it was um, who was it who 
drew the short straw to have me off Rusty Wallace, I think. Do you think they colluded? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, that's a long time ago now, but I, I just knew I wasn't, I wasn't going to win wasn't that race. Going home. Yeah, um, I, I, good again, racing. Though. I loved it. Yeah, I read, I read in your book that you got turned around or you had a spin on, on yeah. an oval Was coming, that uh, coming off turn four. I remember them saying to me, um, "Whatever you do," Daryl Waltrip said to me, who I got on. I just love Daryl Waltrip. He's such a character. Um, he said, "Whatever you do, don't hit the end of the pit wall." And I'm. As, I'm, as I got spun around, I felt each of the four tyres go bang as, they, as you wore a hole in the bottom of them, going 190 miles an hour sideways. And now I'm going down the grass and I'm heading for the end of the pit wall, thinking exactly what Daryl told me. Luckily, it stopped before I got there. So which was more terrifying, that or a Zephyr 6 reversing towards you in... In man a field. with a crowbar. Well, there's the, yeah, the man with a crowbar. And the, I was the Zephyr 6, probably, yeah, because I was... You know, what, what was I, 15 at the time, and I'm, I, I still could barely, I couldn't see over a steering wheel, so I was looking through the steering wheel, so the Zephyr 6 looked r rather big at that point. But you, 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 I'm sure I read in your book that you managed to turn it around, you figured out how you could get the car back pointing the right way, and then of course you had to do that again in Adelaide, was it, in the wet? Uh, you had to get the car, although you weren't yes. entirely sure whether you were yeah, pointing no, the I right had, way. <laughs> I had to go in the pit. No, that, uh, that was one of the scariest things that happened to me. Mm. In, in it's, do you, uh, There's a picture, isn't there, of Senna yeah. coming out of Senna, yeah. hit, yes. hitting me yeah. from behind when the, his team were trying to tell him to slow down. He was angry, wasn't he, because of the problems that had happened in Suzuka and yeah. all that sort of thing, 89. And um, <clears throat> I was on Pirelli's. It was pouring with rain. We weren't going to race. And we're all, and we'd agreed, and Alan Prost, and we'd all agreed we weren't going to race because it was diabolical. Bernie walked down the grid and said, Get in the car, the race is about to start to all of us. So we all got in the car and started. Prost pulled in at the end of the first lap. We go racing. And on, on the Pirelli Wets back then, my little Brabham was just, uh, so I'm in top gear and I'd, I'd loop down the, down the back straight, the Brabham straight, is it called? And it, it, Somehow I didn't hit the wall, extraordinarily. Uh, I was running seventh and there were loads of cars everywhere. And I'm like, get, get out of it. <laughs> Hooked first gear, drove off and realized I didn't know how many times I'd spun. Was it three times? Was it three and a half times? Which direction was I now? It's just two concrete <laughs> walls and the Brabham straight. I didn't know which direction I was heading in. And all I could do was carry on because I knew there were other cars on the racetrack and the conditions were diabolical. And then I saw the numbers on the brake marker board into the hairpin, okay. and I realised I was going the right <laughs> way. That was pretty scary. So next time down the pit, uh, down the back straight, I'm in fifth gear. Going, I can't, can't let that happen again. Flat out in top, and that's when Senna smashed into the back of me, and he came past me um, on three wheels. He, he hit me so hard, mm. he actually overtook me on three wheels. Was it when you um, you were talking earlier about? queuing up to get Jack Brabham's autograph at Brands in yeah, whenever 17, it was, 23, yeah. whenever it was. Yeah. Um, was there any special resonance for you when you ended up actually signing? I know Jack had long gone from Formula 1 then, but the fact you actually ended up driving a Brabham. Um, I hadn't really thought of it like that. I, I, obviously, Brabhams were winning a lot of races when I first got into Formula 1, so it was... Uh, which which they weren't uh, when you signed for them. Um, Bernie had left by then, hadn't he? Bernie yeah. had gone to run Formula 1, so I, I enjoyed my day. I had two years at Brabham. Um, I enjoyed all my days in Formula One, to be honest. The, the Zach Speed decision wasn't my greatest decision, but <laughs> at the time I didn't have any, I didn't have any options, um, and they did, they tried their best. So, no, I mean, I, I, you know, if people say who do you drive for, you know, I list them, and it's McLaren and Benetton and Brabham and Ligier, and you know, I'm, I'm proud of all of those. Let's um, let's look at the time after Zach Speed, and of course, um, to to Le Mans. Um, did. Was there a sense of kind of, um, I don't know, encouragement for Brendan Hartley when he came into Formula One? Because he'd gone away and come back. You'd gone away to Sports Cars Le Mans and come back as well. Um, have you got a kind of a... I, that would, I'd have a soft spot for him if, <laughs> if I was... Uh, well, good, no, good luck to the lad and, yeah. and, and all of them, you know, coming in. It's hard to get to Formula One. It's even harder to stay there. Yeah. And it's something, that's something I've said for 30-odd years now. <laughs> And, it, and it's as true today as it was uh, at, yeah. at any point. Um, I think you, you get a discipline in sports car racing. You learn 
to work with others you you learn how to it's probably you know if you come through junior single seater racing you're not representing a manufacturer you're not representing big sponsors mm. you know it's whoever's funding you and your car and your team you and you're passing through all of a sudden you, you, you've got a you've got to be out there representing a global manufacturer and, and mm. I think it teaches you a lot of things on and off track that are very useful in mm. Formula One it makes you grow up a little bit uh, and see a, see a bigger picture and think the longer game in the car as well you're not just yeah. in a 20 lap Formula 3 race you're suddenly going to get a quadruple stint through the pouring rain at night at Le Mans and uh, it makes you grow up quite fast Speaking of um, global manufacturers, Fernando Alonso is going to be effectively representing three over the next 18 <laughs> yes. months, McLaren, Renault and Toyota. Um, from our perspective in the office, it's good on him. You know, he's, he's going for a two incredibly physical, punishing seasons. I think he's got 10 weekends back to back. It's pretty extraordinary. Um, do you think he's nuts or do you think he's a hero? For no, I, I admire him and, you know, I, I wish, on, as a Grand Prix driver, I always wanted to race a Lotus Cortina and a Formula <laughs> 2 car on the same day, like my heroes, yeah. Jim Clark and, and Graham Hill and Jackie Stewart used to do. Um, yeah. But then you end up specialising. If I was McLaren, I wouldn't let him do it. Yep. Um, because it's going, you know, it, it's going to distract him at some point, travel-wise, or just mm. jumping between the cars. Um, but they had to keep him happy. Um, uh, it, it, I think it's. He, I, I observed him at Daytona this year. My son yeah. was racing. I observed him when he was at Bahrain and Le Mans previously. Yeah. He's in, totally engaged. His work ethic is incredible. And you see the other things he's got in his life, his karting circuit, his museum, and other commercial things. He's, he's going to be one very busy guy. Um, but no, I, I applaud him for mm. being able to jump in different cars. Um, and, you know, as, as I used to do, you know, mm. as, we, as we used to, if, uh, to, to race, you know, touring cars, sports mm. cars, Formula One cars, classics, all that, you, it's just brilliant. Why wouldn't you if, you, if you have a passion for driving racing cars, why wouldn't you drive anything as much as you could at any time? Yeah. I think you may have stumbled across a really interesting support race idea there as well. I mean, maybe the current guys in Lotus Cortinas. Yeah. What do you reckon? <laughs> yeah, on three wheels. On yeah, three so wheels, yeah, yeah, coming through. Around. Yeah. Um, okay, right. So this is where we genuinely jump around. It, this here, there, and everywhere. So um, Jamie Smith asks, it's a very simple one. I'd like to hear some stories of driving for Eddie Jordan. <laughs> Eddie Jordan. Um, well, yes, I, it's funny, isn't it? Because I, I drove for Eddie. I, 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 I was sitting in Dave Price's office. We got to the end of the 82 Form 3 season and BP had decided that they were going to fund Calvin Fish because he'd beaten Ayrton in a Formula Ford 2000 race. Um, and and good good driver, Calvin, and a good lad, and stay in touch with him. Um, he's over doing similar jobs mm. to me, but over in the States now. Um, so I, I'd i won the Commonwealth Driver of the Year, Gro Grovewood Award, was it called back then? 5,000 quid. But I hadn't got a drive, and I sat in Pricey's office, and he's like, Marty, I ain't got nothing for you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ring somebody who has. <laughs> yeah. And the person he rang who had got, he thought might have something for me was Eddie Jordan. So I went straight from Pricey's up to Silverstone, stayed the night at Eddie's place in Silverstone Village. And it turns out Eddie hadn't got any money either. But somehow we hustled through and I gave him the five grand check. I painted one of his best friends, Toyota Hilux trucks in our paint shop at the Toyota, myself. And... Um, we took a Citroen seven-seater familial estate yes, off the forecourt yes. we couldn't sell, <laughs> and that became the crew, the crew bus. We, and so that, that's how we started racing. Eddie blagged money out of Silverstone. Um, Tom Walkinshaw helped us. He loaned us some money he never got back, but I paid him back in many other ways, uh, driving his cars later on. And racing for Britain came in at a critical time. Uh, and, and gave us some money. And so we set off, we started that season with five grand Grovewood Award and a painting a truck. And we ended up doing 21 or 22 races or something Sorry, like that yeah. uh, with the European races that we went into and won. And, um, and that put me into Formula One. And, th and then my, I ended up my career. So Eddie rang me from a pedalo on a lake in Italy. He'd just sold Eddie Irvine to Ferrari, basically. <laughs> and had a, and got a, 
chunk of change. But what he did have was a sponsor in Benson Hedges who demanded a British driver. So he just flogged Eddie um, and he needed a, a Brit in the car. And so we kind of did a deal. I rang Tom. I was, I was driving for Ligier at the time. I said, Tom, I, c I can't turn this deal down. And he wasn't very pleased, but he agreed. And um, I ended up racing for Eddie. It was a, a slightly difficult year because it, the car didn't didn't work as well as we hoped it would aerodynamically. It but didn't when it, didn't when it was upside down in Australia, did it? No. <laughs> That's Coulthard's fault and Herbert's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Tripped over each other. Bridge. No, I started. No, I blew up in. But uh, I blew up quite a lot of times that year. But um, I blew up in practice and ended up at the back of the grid and. I was started 19th. I was P6 or P7 by turn three, but unfortunately I was upside down at that moment. Yeah. So do you think uh, Lance Stroll's ever painted a Toyota Hilux truck on his, <laughs> to, to, to raise funds for Rare? I'm just curious. I don't know you might. <laughs> you know what? You, whatever, you use whatever facilities are available to you, don't you? Um, yeah. I, I, I doubt it very much, <laughs> but um, I, could, I could paint a mean truck, actually. Mm. Okay, remember that. So uh, Martin Brundle, <laughs> uh, past tense. <laughs> Just we place a very cheap ad if you, you know. Um, right, Bill in Sydney, um, and this is Jordan related. Uh, it's the Colin McRae. You, you swap cars with him at Silverstone '96, I think yeah. Bill says. Um, yeah. What were your impressions of Colin's driving that day? And I'll add to that: could he have stuck it on the grid for a for a race? Yeah, definitely. Colin was fast. He got in the car, if fearless. I mean, he did a practice start and came so close to wiping the car down the pit wall at Silverstone. Was, <laughs> there, were, there were no devices there to save you. It was, a, you know, just pure. And so he, he, he dialed so much energy into the transmission, transmission system. Yeah. It's tri tripping over my tongue here. Um, <laughs> it just lit it up and there was so much energy in the rear tyres. He just about wiped it down the wall. But that aside, he drove really well. Mm -hmm. And I think there is no doubt with they've Colin. And he drove at Le Mans, didn't he, in a he Ferrari? Did, 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 did. I think there's no doubt with um, yeah, calming down a bit and some time, he, he would have been a fast, fast racing driver. Why, why not? Yeah. Um, my overriding impression of that day was... Uh, thankfully, I didn't. I, I, he couldn't fit me in the single seater uh, to take me round Silverstone, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> but of course... He had to come in the rally car with me. I've never seen a man looking for an imaginary <laughs> brake pedal so much as we went through the forest with me barely in control of this Subaru Impreza. And I could see him looking ahead, <laughs> pressing the brake pedal like crazy. Uh, we didn't crash. And most, most racers and rally drivers are awful passengers, aren't they? Yeah, well, I certainly am. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, Patrick Down. Jump in at any time because I'm going to try and run through these. And I'm sure you've got 100 one questions as well. Uh, question from Patrick Down. Um, Schumacher and Hacken and both teammates in the early 90s, who was faster? Um, are there any other teammates on their sort of level that just didn't get the chance to prove it? So Schumacher and Hacken, and who was the quickest? Let's say it's a one lap. Absolutely. Uh, Hacken and speed. Right. Hacken, uh, I think, is the fastest teammate I ever had in terms of raw, sheer speed. Um, yeah, you've always got to, there's always somebody around who's going to spoil your part in there. I mean, I came through Formula 3 against Senna and then <laughs> ended up as teammates with Hacken and Schumacher. Um, but there's, there's always, you've got, so you've got to beat them whether they're in the same team or another team. So um, Michael what was, Michael drove, I always say Ayrton drove with his heart, Michael drove with his head. Mm. Mick uh, just had pure brutal speed and relied on everybody else to, deliver him the car that would um, it's it's such a straightforward simple approach to his to his racing and he just drove the car and, and left the engineers to worry about uh, about the rest of it from what I could tell uh, whereas Michael was much more engaged in you know bringing galvanizing and bringing everybody else around him um, but I don't think Michael had quite and we're talking tiny amounts here yeah, yeah. I w uh, Ayrton had the most god-given talent I've ever seen. I think he he just had a, I always explain it that, that Ayrton had a feel for grip before and during a corner where us mere mortals had a feel for grip during and after a corner. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if I've got time to bore you with a story uh, about about him at Silverstone uh, with, uh, with the Ayrton Center and um, pouring a rain. 
we, we had it up. I got a better start. Uh, we're on the front row of the grid. I lead down into Cop's Corner, Stowe Corner, sorry, pouring with rain. And Senna goes down the outside. And I'm thinking, see you, wouldn't want to be you out there. <laughs> yeah, Senna's off, Senna's off. He went skirting all the way around the outside on the karting line, which I never did karting, so I, I wasn't really sort of much into that. And came out in front of me, came out of Stowe Corner in front of me. I'm like, how did you do that? And I was miffed with it. And then they threw the red flags. Kiki Mansilla had had a massive shunt somewhere through the red flags. So we all come back to the pits. Now we're going to you know, go back round to, to restart the race. I thought, I'm going to try Senna's line through Stowe. Went down there, hit a puddle of water, went on the grass, just kept it out of the barriers around the outside of uh, the grass. And I went, there used to be a little rubbish out there on the outside of Stowe Corner. Survived for another day, restarted the race. Senna beat me off the line this time. He won the race, I was second. And on the podium, I said to him, your, your line through Stowe didn't work in the second part of the race, did it? And he said, I don't know, I didn't try, it was too wet. <laughs> Damn him. And that sums up it and Senna's talent yeah. to me. He, he had yeah. this gift to know, to know where the grip was. <clears throat> okay, this, this, I'm gonna hook your comment there about teammates with something that uh, Rob JW has asked, and it's, it's about another teammate, but Sterling Moss. Different yep. cars, different era. Rob asked, you know, what was it like to have him as a teammate? I'm going to ask, was he a head or a heart driver, Sterling, from what you saw? Uh, he was just silky smooth. Right. Um, he regrets doing that, Sterling, as yeah. coming back. He always says it's, um, I don't know how he, he was 51 years old. I was 21 years old. It was 1981. I was stupid. All I wanted to do is blow the doors off Sterling Moss, mm -hmm. which I did because, you know, it was slick tires and, you know, and basically fundamentally i was the i was a quick driver and instead of going what can i learn you know thankfully i you know sterling Zuzi are friends of ours to this day and and mm. i hold the man in you, it, it, i could not hold him in any higher esteem of course and i'm sure we're all the same um but i didn't i didn't learn as much from sterling as i could i remember one day at brands hatch when it was half wet half dry he just waltzed off into the distance because that was the kind of grip level he was used to basically <laughs> not a lot and we were all struggling around it started off badly uh, not with me and sterling but with sterling and the team we turned up at mallory park for the first test and they'd spelt his name incorrectly as in pound sterling on the door <laughs> which he took, <laughs> which he was not very pleased about at all as you might imagine um and he was just a bit frustrated a about the whole thing but my overall <laughs> Overriding memory, I'd never met him before. We were, we were doing a team picture at Silverstone uh, behind the BRDC sort of bungalow they used to have at the front there. And we were changing in the gents' toilets because there was nowhere else to change to put our overalls on for a picture that they use in an advert actually later on. And I'm think, I'm, as I'm putting my, my fireproofs on in the gents' toilet of the BRDC bungalow with Sterling Moss, to sound right does it actually in the end <laughs> but uh, I'm thinking this is a bit surreal <laughs> a, a lovely man amazing driver and what what he's been through personally you know the the trials and tribulations he's had personally you know with his, you know with his incidents and accidents and health it's just extraordinary remarkable man um right we're, we're gonna we're coming towards the end now and I haven't got through all of the questions but we've got through quite a few and actually we've answered um in a way, in a roundabout way, some of the questions that, that's have, that have been asked. So I do thank you all for, for posting your questions and, and I hope, hope we've managed to get through um, as many topics as we can. Um, so I'm, I'm going to bring things to a close and I'm going to put this man on the spot. Sorry about this, Simon. Um, right, Adelaide, 1994, F1, the podium is Nigel Mansell, Gerhard Berger uh, and Martin. Um, what did Martin say about that podium in his book? <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. Ask me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to confess that um, I, 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 A, I wasn't there, and um, B, I, I think I probably watched on telly and then went to watch the Formula Ford Festival. But the, um, that was the combined <laughs> age of those drivers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 that's it. Yeah, it was, was 100, it? 111. And, and the phrase old duffers. Yeah, that's um, not what I said. How <laughs> yeah. disrespectful. I, I do think b b before we close, one thing, one thing we haven't discussed yeah. is, is, 20, is apart from. Halos is 2018. I just yeah. Um, that was my segue. Oh, sorry, oh, no, sorry, no, no, sorry. No, sorry. So I've just stolen his segue. Anyway, I just yeah. Look, looking ahead to the, do you think it's going to be more of the same? 
Mercedes Ferrari, or do you think Red Bull going to interlope a little bit? How do you? How do you, we've only had two tests as we speak. It's hard to know exactly the picture that was painted by that. But how do you see things evolving? I, I hope that Ferrari and Red Bull can take it to Mercedes. Mm. You know, I, I admire Mercedes, and you can't blame Mercedes for anything. They're they work into a set of regulations and they've just created the best team and the best car and well done to them. Um, but of course we, we want surprises and we had a few last year with Ferrari taking it to them on, on certainly in the early part of the season and of course Red Bull, uh, for example, Verstappen in, in Mexico. Uh, so I, I really hope that they're, they're close by. I mean, unfortunately the, the way the playing field is in Formula One at the moment is, and it's got to change, the haves and the have-nots are just too far apart. We don't have our FA Cup days when, mm. you know, the minnows can beat the champions. Um, and if you've got $150, a million dollar head start on a midfield team and you've got a thousand people working uh, tirelessly on, you know, making a racing car better, it's going to be faster. It's going to be more reliable. And, uh, you know, so the, uh, in a way, we... You asked me the question because we know they're the teams, the pecking order of the teams. I think the midfield could be more interesting this year. McLaren should be getting their act together. Haas look good. Uh, for example, Renault look much better. It's, it's, I think there's going to be some great racing there. I just hope there's great racing at the front as well. Um, my gut feeling is that Mercedes I don't think they're going to run and hide, but we've only had the test. Let, let's wait and see. And you don't know who's running what fuel levels, or all the normal caveats of winter testing. But in my heart of hearts, I've got a feeling Mercedes might be relatively stronger than they were last year. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like they've got something and not something, mm. something in hand. I hope that's wrong. <laughs> right. My, my segue before Simon ruined it for oh, me. I'm only joking. It was, it was an age, it was an age, age thing. And I, and I was, I looked at, um, doing some research on driver ages and we've got uh, six drivers who are over 30 uh, in Formula 1 this year uh, looks like we've got nine, eight or nine that are 25 to 28 uh, and we've got two, four, six, seven who are under 23 years old so there's seven drivers in Formula 1 this year who are younger than you were when you made your debut you're 24 I think yeah. is that right? 24 okay um, Let's pick out the superstars from those groups, okay? So I, I wonder if you could, if you could pick, you don't have to say which one's the best, but the guys who are absolutely at the top of their age range. Mm. So under 25s, Stroll, Verstappen, Ocon, Sorokin, Gasly, Science Junior, and Kvyat. Um, they, they are, Kvyat's not in, is he? Oh, that was last year. <laughs> He's out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think which car he's driving. That's, That's a trick right, question. No, <laughs> That's a trick he, he, question. He's for always 15 to reserve uh, or something. I, I wish he was still in a car, actually. Um... Uh, that's a great group, isn't it, though? Science mm, Junior I'm it? a big fan of. Yeah. Um... Ocon is a star of the future. Yeah, I think I, Ocon... I think I, 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 uh, the, the superstar there, of course, is Verstappen. Yeah. Yeah, that kid's got a feel for grip that I haven't seen for a very long time and probably for since a man, you're, since man you're called Senna. Going the outside is still. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely <laughs> outstanding. So that and that makes me feel very good, that group of youngsters, yeah. because there's some great talent in there and that as always they are the you know, that's the future of Formula One. Okay. The thing that's impressed me about Ocon was when he was coming up, when he beat for Schnapp into the Formula Three title, and his reward for that was to get shuffled sideways to G P three yeah. and while Max went up and a lot of drivers might have been discouraged, dispirited, whatever, but he went out and won the GP3 title. And I thought that was a really good sign of strong mental yeah. uh, approach. I mean, just not worrying about the other stuff, just getting on with what he's got to do. And yeah. it's taken him a bit longer, but he's got there. Yeah. Okay, the, the over, well, I was going to say over 25s, but they're not. They're 25 to 28. Magnussen, uh, Van Dorn, Gutierrez, Ericsson, Perez, Hartley, Bottas, Ricciardo. Gutierrez isn't there either. <laughs> Good job. He's, not there, he's either. also a Ferrari test. So it's my estate deep down <laughs> wish that there were another two or four cars on the grid. Yeah, me that's too. What that's what um, I'm doing. Yeah. I nearly put Nazar in as well. Is it? Is it? No, he's, no, he's not. not is there, no, yeah, there he's go. gone. So Magnussen, Van Dorn, Ericsson, Perez, Hartley, Bottas, Ricciardo. Uh, Ricciardo's the outstanding one in, in that group. Uh, I think Valtteri Bottas did a super job against uh, an, an in increasingly good job against Lewis Hamilton. Yeah. Would never underestimate Valtteri. Um, Stoffel, Jerry, Stoffel, I, I think he's got a, 
decent career ahead of him. I mm-hmm. think he's he's come up the hard way. He's earned his he's earned his seat, and I think he uh, Van Dorn. I think is a slow burn. I think he'll just keep keep improving. But but the the guy who can steal a victory out of nowhere, which is really hard to do in motorsport, um, you know, win a race. As Tom Walkinshaw used to say to me, he'll nay win a mutty race, he should near one anyway, or something like that. My, my impressions are terrible today, aren't they? And, and that's a good line because, it, um, you know, do you win, do you win, you know, I, there's a few races I won in a Jaguar that I'm super proud of because I shouldn't have won those races. And, and Ricardo was the same in a Formula One car. Mm. He steals some races because of his guile. He's not yeah. really had a car yet that you'd say, that car should win the race today from pole position. Yeah, yeah. So here's the old guys. I can't believe I'm saying this, but um, over 30s. What are you going to put in there? You're not going to put <laughs> fund, fund Moss. You, fund you and Moss aren't doing it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I struggle with those. Um, so uh, Nico Hulkenberg is 30, Vettel's 30, Grosjean's 31, Lewis is 33, Fernando's 36, and Kimi, bless him, um, 38. So, I mean, let's, let's actually uh, flip it around. Who, who, who do we want to stay in F1 rather than retire? Uh, they're all household names, really, aren't yeah. they? Um, I have a view that your peak is between 28 and 34. And I think, I think that'll be, that'll, if anything, th- that window will stretch a bit, but I think yeah. we'll come younger. But for me, that crossover point between skill, bravery, fitness, desire, yeah. all merges to peak. 28 to 34 um, but then you would argue well hang on what about Mansell and Prost but I think mm. back in those days experience counted for more than it does today there's so much simulation work so much so many sensors on the car so much data it's a data driven business that I think that you don't need to remember all of your springs and gear yeah. ratios and anti-roll bar settings from three years ago anymore because there's a myriad of engineers to worry about that for you and then the cars are way way more complex to set up so um, having said all of that you know many of those guys are beyond my 34 limit but they're still doing still doing a great job I, um, Vettel when he's when he's yeah. in form I think Vettel is pretty spectacular. Hamilton, when he when he brings his A game, he is unbeatable. I don't think there's anybody that in that list that can beat Lewis Hamilton when he's absolutely on it and focused and not distracted by by something else. Um, yeah. And, and Fernando, Fernando <coughs> he's just a terrier dog, isn't he? He just <laughs> relentlessly <laughs> drives the wheels. Of everything, and and you know even Kimi can keep um, Vettel yeah. in, in line and in view, but I can't help but think I'd like to see a Ricardo or somebody else alongside Vettel now, or an yeah. Ocon, or uh, you know we'll see how Leclerc goes this year, and that 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 would, and that's exactly what Vettel doesn't want, of course. Mm. He, uh, the last time Ricardo rocked up alongside him was at Red Bull, and it didn't go didn't but go well for Vettel, did yeah. it? Yeah, he's another one, the Leclerc in the under under twenty five. He looks like everything points to him being a star, and maybe um, Lando as well in, in yeah. F two this year. Oh yeah, we've got a lot of young Brits coming along, haven't we? Yeah. George Russell and yeah. uh, so, so many, uh, mm. and some fantastic Brits, young Brits coming along. But do you know what? You don't, you can't prejudge. I don't think these these drivers because Formula One's a big spotlight to be under, and a spotlight can either make you grow and give you energy or it can wilt you like a flower and mm-hmm. so I think you have to wait and see how they handle the complexity and pressure and relentless observation and measurement that f- being a Formula 1 driver entails today Okay, uh, but going through the older ones, I mean, agree complete with all the points you made but uh, in the unlikely event that I, were, that I had £5,000 I could start a racing team tomorrow um, the one I'd choose for a blank sheet of paper would be still be Ferdy, I think. I know Lewis is absolutely unbeatable when he's on his game, but Ferdy seems to be on his game every lap of the season, pretty much. Um, I think he, I think he's, I think there's just still something about him that um, if if I had a blank sheet of paper, I was starting a team, he'd probably have Hamilton in the other car. But I think I'd definitely choose Ferdy. He brings a bit of baggage with him, doesn't he? He's quite, he he's does. quite hot to handle. But yeah, I can't, but, I can't disagree with you. I mean, he's. Yeah. He's incredible. His, his and I mentioned it earlier on his work ethic and mm-hmm. his relentless determination is 
is extraordinary. He should be at least a four-time world champion by now. Mm-hmm. And, and I think, and I, something I said recently, you know, he, he actually needs somebody around him who's stronger than he is, but I'm not sure such a person actually exists. <laughs> um, but he, he really needs somebody mm-hmm. around him like, no, Fernando, no, we're not doing that. Not we're doing, you know, this is what you should do. And almost guide him a little bit. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, he's fallen out with, he should be in the Ferrari now, for example. Yeah. Um, he, he could have won a um, championship for McLaren, but that ended in tears, didn't it, in, in 2007. So one way and another, if you could, you know, p- have guided Fernando better, I think he, he would be in a stronger place today than, than he is. But I can't disagree with your comments about his driving. Martin, thank you. We, we have My to pleasure. wrap it up, I'm afraid. Um, thanks, thanks for listening as well, and thanks for your questions. Um, yeah, it's been a real pleasure to host you here, and, 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 and please take a look at the um, Grand Prix Trust website as well, and take a look at the motorsportmagazine.com website as well for some, for some more information. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, tell your friends, share it with your friends, um, comment, say some nice things about us all, please. Um, it's always a pleasure to bring these to you. Thanks for Mercedes-Benz as well, and also thanks to our official biscuit supplier, um, Rob. Halloway. Thank you very much. And we are going to eat those now. So um, we'll be back soon with another podcast. Thanks again, Martin. Thanks to you all. Thanks to Simon. Hey, Jack. I've, um, I've got new ones. You look really grown up. Very smart, Jack. <laughs> like your sisters. <laughs> Can I have that? Jack. The way you work it, no diggity. I got to bag it up. Bag it up. I like the way you.